find out what Dave Marshak from Ski School is up to now, and if Grand Crew exists in the same universe as Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Plus, we'll find out why there was a no dolly shots before noon rule on Ski School. All this and more on today's Last Looks. Hit the theme. Last Looks. Hello, my Section 8 ski students. I'm your ski instructor and party enthusiast, Paul Shear, and welcome to How Did This Get Made? Last Looks, as I will take you on a journey up to the tip of Mount Party, and you will get to voice your issues on ski school. Plus, Jason and I will chat with our pals Carl Tart, put your T's in the chat for Carl, and Phil Augusta Jackson uh, about the new season of their hilarious NBC sitcom, Grand Crew. If you're not watching, people... You're missing out, but we have a great conversation also about music in uh, that little Just Chat segment. So stay tuned for that. Plus, we are going to reveal next week's movie as well. But first things first, a big shout out to Sean Fogel. Sean, killing it with that theme. I loved it. Uh, And we want more, more themes from Sean, maybe even from you. If you have a theme, send it to us at HowDidThisGetMade at Earwolf.com. That's HowDidThisGetMade at Earwolf.com. Keep them short, 15, 20 seconds. That's best. Um, All right, let's get into it. Last week, we talked at length about ski school, and now you get a chance to get on your soapbox. I don't know. Anyway, it's time for corrections and omissions. For all the things we talked about, There were things we did leave out So now it's time for corrections and omissions Thank you, Dornheim, for that great theme. Let's go right to the Discord. Screaming Joe Blade. Okay, this is a great one. Uh, Screaming Joe Blade writes, This episode gave me flashbacks to my first couple of jobs in the Toronto film industry when I worked with both the director and DP of this film. I remember the DP talking about ski school. Apparently, the grip department enjoyed the party scene in Whistler a lot, and they were often in such bad shape in the morning that they had a strict no dolly shots before noon. (laughs) Um, two other great memories working on these films were having to push a character's picture vehicle into the shot as he pretended to drive up because the car didn't run. Great. And having to pay most of my deals in cash because the production company had a bad reputation for running out of money and checks bouncing. It's a great introduction to filmmaking. You know what? Screaming Joe Blade, I did not expect us to have this kind of an inside scoop. And I love it. Every single detail. No dolly shots before noon. Amazing. Uh, Johnny Unusual writes, Our heroes, being in Section 8, is actually a gag. The term Section 8 is a U.S. military discharge term for those deemed mentally unfit for service. In a much less savory aspect of history, crossdressers and LGBTQ people used to be placed in this category too. And the TV show MASH, Corporal Klinger, started crossdressing in an attempt to be given a Section 8. Eight discharge. You see, I knew that sounded familiar. Thank you for bringing that to my attention, Johnny Unusual. Uh, Corgi Herder actually has a little bit of an addendum to that, though, because there's actually a real Section 8 Snow Sport Institute in Canada where you can become a ski instructor. Their website doesn't mention visible breasts, but they do advertise a laid back island lifestyle with ridiculous amounts of powder. The founder, by the way, Toby. Leo Bikki learned to ski at Whistler, where a lot of ski school was filmed. So, Corgi, are you saying that maybe this is a true story? This is a biopic? I mean, Scott, our producer, chimes in and says their website also mentions their founder did, in fact, name the business Section 8 snow sport as a nod to ski school, which was his favorite movie as a teenager. So... Party on, Tobin. I love that Ski School has really taken over in this big way that I was not aware of. There's a whole episode of Always Sunny in Philadelphia that is basically a Ski School sequel uh, or a redo. I have to watch that one as well. Uh, Dr. Guts 1003 writes, the announcer frequently refers to the competition in the first few days as being a qualifying event, yet the results don't seem to matter at all as all the sections are still competing at the end of the movie. If you're making the effort to have the announcer mention qualifying rounds, why not have that be the obstacle that prevents Section 8 from participating in the end? They could fail to qualify due to excessive partying or uh, more Section 1 grappling hook shenanigans. Using Dean 
Wormer wannabe kick Section 8 out seem like a lazy, half-hearted attempt at creating conflict. Wow. Well, Dr. Guts 1003, y- y- you think that this movie was lazy? You think that they didn't think it all through? But by the way, what you're presenting here is basically an obstacle that could not be overcome. Like, if they are disqualified, they could not get into it. Like, this idea of like wanting to kick them out at least keeps them in the in the mix like you're just creating something that would take away the the final ending i'm not saying that i like the dean wormer ending but at least it gives us a reason for the, for the ending you just want to cut it you want the you want the the richies to win dr guts is that what i'm getting anyway let's go to the phones uh stephanie from new jersey what do you got Hi, Paul. this is stephanie from new jersey um just calling about ski school and <laughs> I was a little upset by the fact that um, you guys said ski school doesn't exist because in the 90s, um, as a kid, my mom would or my parents would send me away over Christmas break for like 10 days to a ski school. And it was pretty wild. Um, I was a younger kid, so like it wasn't, you know, chainsaw wild. But then on top of that, I went on and became a ski instructor. And we definitely also have schools for ski instructors. And those were a little bit more wild. Um, more on teen saw level, um, and there were girls, and they did ski, and they did talk. They weren't just in bikinis. So there you have it. All sorts of ski school for ski people. <laughs> That's it. Bye. Whoa, breaking news. Stephanie laying it down. Ski school does exist, and ski instructor school exists as well. And there is a lot of partying again Another check in the column that this is a biopic. This is gritty. This is real. This should have been nominated for awards. See, people just took it for granted. They, they, they believed that the story was so fantastical uh, that it couldn't have been real uh, the same way that Avatar has been received. People don't believe that that is actually happening. I have the proof. Follow me on my InfoWars spinoff show where I talk about the truth about Pandora and the Takloon, which is that giant uh, whale. Uh, Anyway, I'll get into it on that show. Uh, Kit from Los Angeles, what do you got? So there's a scene where after they've like, or they're like hooking up the camera to all the TVs and the clubs, they're going to film the guys supposedly having sex. Um, And one of the guys is like, all right, hey, I'm having trouble with this. Do you have the user manual? And he he sets the manual on fire and hands it to him, and for, and for whatever reason, and the guy's like just constant and like is just reading it in earnest, trying to like figure it out before it like burns up. I just thought that scene was absolutely insane. Of you know, in a film full of insane scenes. That's all. Kit, I appreciate you just taking a moment to just get in on the on the on the small level. Just be like, this is <laughs> insane. And you know what? You're right. In a movie of insane things, that is like when you think about it fully, one of the most insane things. Not not the obviously. I think the grappling hook is is very much up there. Uh, but yes, I appreciate you just taking a moment to to step back and appreciate the finer absurdity of this movie. Uh, and finally, Chrissy from Dallas, what do you got? Oh, hi, Paul. This is Christy in Dallas. I am calling because I was on IMDb and I saw that the beautiful Victoria from um, this week's movie Ski School also played Jen's mom in Dancing It's On. That was her last credited role. Um, I just thought that was very funny. And um, to to see her as a as a skinhead all star. So, Thanks so much. Enjoy your Oscars night. Bye. Whoa! Way to go, Chrissy. Get on that IMDb. And I mean that sincerely. None of us picked that up. Now I got to look at a side by side. Man, oh man, way to go, Chrissy. That I, you know what? I think you've, I think you're in the mix now, Chrissy. I think you're in the mix for winner of the week because you did the research. Um, okay, let's go back to the Discord. Catfish writes. 
I did not realize until I listened to the episode, but this movie ends with a giant plot twist. At the very beginning of the movie, Marshak says, you're too late to read. I've already put in a motion and elaborate plan, a series of events diabolically designed to get rid of this mountain and you and your satanic presence forever. And in fact, he had. He'd already somehow brokered the deal for the model slash millionaire to purchase a mountain and rebrand it as Party Mountain. Since he already has an in with the future owner, he knows that nothing said nor done by Reed or the current owner matters at all. While watching the movie unfold, you think Marshak's aloof, devil-may-care attitude is just his anti-authority personality, when in fact, he is just basking in his victory for the entire running time, way ahead of everyone else. Catfish, I'm right there with you. I knew it. I saw it. This movie is like another award-winning film, The Usual Suspects, where everything changes at the end. And again, why wasn't it nominated? As Jason said, could this be nominated this year retroactively? I think we should be giving out Oscars to uh, films that the Academy missed, and that would have been uh, a perfect opportunity this year to start it with Ski School. Uh, Sean and Risa chiming in together, writes, we were really surprised that no one brought up the third episode of season 11 of Always Sunny in Philadelphia titled The Gang Hits the Slopes. It serves as a parody to Ski School and is a hilarious companion to this movie for anyone wanting to know what happens to Dave Marshak when he hits middle age. In this episode, Dean Cameron plays the same character who's an older party animal skier leading a ragtag team against a corrupt businessman and his preppy douche pro skier henchmen who are trying to buy the mountain. Which mountain is he trying to buy? Oh, a little ski mountain called Party Mountain. Uh, I love it. You know, um, I want to play a clip of this because one of the things we were talking about is the announcer in Ski School and how the announcer really was laying down a lot of plot. And here's a little clip from Always Sunny where Charlie Day even jokes about this announcer and how he knows so much about everything on the mountain. Take a listen. Last day to squeeze in some turns before tomorrow's big race. On a side note, it's good to see Frank Reynolds back on the hill. We'll see if he can patch things up with old rival Dave Drisco, but I wouldn't count on it. Yo, hey, Dennis, did you just hear that? What? That, that PA announcement. What, what, what was that? Well, there's a lot of people on this mountain, Charlie. Everybody's got to stay informed. Yeah, but that guy was, like, saying a bunch of, like, really personal information about us. Like, how does huh. he know that? That's how it works. But why is he talking about us? There's, like, hundreds of people out here. Well, we're the most important thing that's happening right now. Oh, I love it. So funny. Now I need to know what happened to Dave Marshak. <laughs> I'm going to watch that right now. Uh, so many great corrections and omissions this week, but there can only be one that is the best. And this week, it has to go to, and, and I think you all know where I'm going, it's got to go to Screaming Joe Blade, who gave us the best piece of information that we've ever gotten about a film, which is no dolly shots before noon. Now, I wish I could give you something uh Screaming Joe Blade, but I can't. I can only give you this amazing song that was written for you by Honest Jams. Hit it! Okay, if you want to chime in with your own thoughts about the latest episode, hit up the Discord at discord.gg slash hdtgm or call me at 619 Paul asked at 619-P-A-U-L-A-S-K. Our Discord is also currently taking ideas for squares on a How Did This Get Made bingo card that uh, you can play while listening to each episode. So if you have any ideas for common scenarios, phrases, or tropes from the show, submit your ideas at tinyurl.com slash hdtgm bingo. That's tinyurl.com slash hdtgm bingo. Coming up next, Jason and I are joined by Carl Tart and Phil Augusta Jackson to talk about season two of NBC's Grand Crew and a lot more stuff. Stick around. Welcome back. You've likely noticed that on the How Did This Get Made feed every Monday, we have been pulling old episodes of How Did This Get Made out of the vault and re-releasing them back into the rotation. This week's matinee Monday was Abraxas, Guardian of the Universe, which was directed by Damian Lee, who also directed Ski School. And next week's matinee Monday will be Transformers Revenge of the Fallen, which shares a director with next week's film, which I will reveal at the end of this episode. Ooh, exciting, isn't it? All right, before we get to all of that, I am excited 
to sit down today and chat with Phil Augusta Jackson and Carl Tart. Uh, Jason and I, we improvise with these guys. They're incredibly talented. Phil Augusta Jackson uh, is an improviser, a musician. He is a writer. He wrote on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He wrote on Kim Peel, and he has created Grand Crew. Carl Tart, uh, one of the funniest guys out there. Uh, love performing with him. He's popped up in shows like Brooklyn Nine-Nine. He is a lead, obviously, on Grand Crew, and he is a regular on Comedy Bang Bang, and he comes on to my Twitch show with Rob Hubel a lot. Uh, just a great guy, and these are two great guys talking about their show and what they're up to. Uh, but before we get into that, take a little listen to Grand Crew. Hey, Trim, you see that girl back there? The girl at the jukebox? Oh, yeah, she's cute. All right, so I'm coming back from the bathroom. I hear her going on and on and on about boxing. I figure you go over there, talk to her about boxing. You probably have a shot. Mm, that's what I'm talking about, Nikki. Thanks for looking out. <laughs> now, y'all prepare to watch a master at work. <laughs> Get it? Get it? I made all of that up. This is a prank. She wasn't talking about boxing. Amazing. Oh, this is going to be a disaster, my beloved. Oh, start. Okay. Oh, oh, there you oh, go. This is even better than I thought it would be. Oh. He's actually pretending to box. I don't understand. Look Did he him? tell her that he's a boxer? Wow. What is wow. he doing? Wow, wow. Good little combo. Oh, good. he took a Ooh. he took a shot. It was oh, kind wow. of a sticking move. Okay, he's doing the matrix. Yeah, he's like she don't like it. Oh, she doesn't like it. She's telling him something. She's telling the lead. She's saying I don't like violence. Oh, no. Oh, here come. oh we got him good. That could not have gone better. We're headed back to her place. Thank you, Nikki. Please welcome Phil, Augusta Jackson, and Carl Tart. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for thank having you us. Thank you for having us. You guys are getting, you guys are getting uh, horse voice subdued. Sorry, yeah. You guys are in like the after dark of this show. Like, this Shear's this doing his like, 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 like sexy uh, yeah, um, Forsythia, the, the <laughs> Lennon Parham <laughs> character. Let me get, let me get had... a cigarette out for that. <laughs> I know, it's smoky. I like Paul, it. These are the same cigarettes from, from uh, Rob and Paul. <laughs> I... I haven't in had 2020. <laughs> Wait, Carl, I did not expect you to just actually pull out a cigarette. <laughs> really? Yes. Carl really put a cigarette in his mouth. I love this. And these cigarettes, like I said, are two years old. These are like middle of the pandemic. A, a bit that I did on Robin Paul. Yes, I and remember I, oh, that that's cigarette. funny. I went to the store and bought a pack of cigarettes. That's great. And mm. they're still full because I don't smoke. My wife, uh, June, who's on How Did This Get Me With Us, when we go to a party, she can get a cigarette going very quickly. I don't know. We never buys a pack, but every party, I'll see her in the corner smoking little, with somebody, some stranger, <laughs> getting a little cigarette action on. Like, I feel like it's, I know that she's having a good time if a cigarette is out and happening. Like, it just feels like that is really like, and it's, it's becoming less and less of a thing where you can find I a lot of people. I could tell you the last time I smoked a cigarette. And I mean, oh my gosh. genuinely 30 years ago it's a rough flavor. It's like, it's a too intense for yeah. me when I like one time I, on this show, black Monday, we were doing, we had to smoke all the time. And in the pilot, we were like, all right, just light us another cigarette, light another cigarette. And that was those like fake cigarettes. Yeah. And the, it just, and I would breathe into my pillow and it would get this, this, this like, I, what I was breathing back at myself was so disgusting. I was like, oh, this must be a million times worse if you are I think, an I actual think smoker. The amount of fake drugs that I've had to take at some point is going to give me the, a worse cancer than if I had actually <laughs> uh, smoked cigarettes or, you know, like the, the fake stuff they give you to snort. The, all the fake stuff is terrible. Well, that's what I was going to ask. Have you, you've done fake cocaine? Yeah. What? Oh, yeah. What is it? Yeah, what is it? Because it looks nuts. like it's nuts. Nuts. And then there's like a lactose one. I, I can't think do that's that. the one that I had at um at something that that recently I had to like bury my nose in and take up. And it was like Ooh. I was getting so much on it Brooklyn. We did it. Yeah, yeah. Too. I remember, on Brooklyn. We I remember, did it. Yeah, because I couldn't remember. That's what made me think of it. Because I I couldn't remember if we actually showed Pimento doing the cocaine or if we dipped you out of frame. But like, uh, I go down, but I do still <laughs> get it. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> oh, man. Well, like, this is interesting because Grand Crew obviously takes place in this wine bar. Mm -hmm. And you all are drinking wine all the time. And I think that that's what people don't know, too. Like, what is that? Like, because it could that... When we used to drink beer in the league, it would be very, like, just get disgusting after a while. What is the flavor palette that you're getting on the wine that is in uh, in Grand Cru? So some people drink 
uh, flavored water. I think okay. Nicole drinks a flavored water. Uh, Justin drinks a flavored water. Aaron drinks fake wine, which is disgusting. They have poured me some. It's oh. very bad. It just tastes like huh. vinegar juice. I don't know how he does it, but you know he's real one of those real actory types. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I drink diet cran grape ocean spray. Okay, that's what okay. they used to give us for wine on the league too, which is too sweet. It's like very when sweet you do, to do multiple takes. multiple t- yeah yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, that's why I do diet. I personally okay. would love the real deal, but <laughs> just drinking wine. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, not oh, just no, no. Wine, like, real, 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 real grape, real real grape. grape cocktail. But yeah, I would gain twenty five pounds throughout the, the <laughs> course of the season if I drink real. Oh grape man, because we used to have that thing too. Where, like whenever you do um, a show, I think set in a bar, like you also have like it's it's a high class, but it's a wine bar. Mm-hmm. So there's there's more things around. Like even on the league, we just have a a tray of like mixed nuts, and you're eating that all day too. And like all of a sudden, you're like, oh, I've eaten like 10 bowls of this or I've, I've like dipped into the food too much and you just go home feeling disgusting at the end of the day. <laughs> it is they, a, they push charcuterie out for us and I will find something that I want to eat and I'll talk to the prop lady and be right. like, hey, how many grapes do you have? Because right. <laughs> I also am, and I th- this is a secret, but it's not a secret. I'm sure other actors do the same thing. But I heard when I watched Ocean's Eleven, I think when I was like 12 years old when it first came out that Brad Pitt is always eaten yeah. in yeah. his scenes. It's the shrimp cocktail in the in Ocean's. Yeah. 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 And and so I'm now like, I if I have the option to be eating something, I also think it's always funny. Yeah. So like it, it's a it's a choice that I'm glad I get to make on the show, but like if we're ever like at a party, like I want a big bowl of chips. Yeah. I want, and, <laughs> and I'm not really, I maybe eat five because of continuity, but right. like I want to be having that. To me, that's all, whenever anybody is eating something, when like Maxine Shaw on Living Single would always be eating when she came into the room. Uh, Cole on Martin would always be eating when he came into the room. I think Joey would mm-hmm. be eating a lot on Friends when like, so like that's food is always funny to me. Like just people working with I'm food. So, yeah. Oh, I, yeah, I go ahead. I was Mark. just going to say, I, as, as the person who sits in the edit bay and edits the show, I, I was wondering how intentional it is because I definitely noticed and I love it. <laughs> it's like it's like it's like there's cereal, there's chips. He's like always he's always working with something. It is and it is it is always funny and it's always great. <laughs> there's something great about having a prop. I agree. On the on the league, it was just a one off joke in one of the episodes that it would be funny if my character just pulled food out of his pocket. <laughs> And I was like, oh, it'd be funny if it was a hot dog. Can you guys make a hot dog? And I'll just pull a fully cooked hot dog in a bun, like ready to go out of my pocket. And that became a joke that then recurred so often that there would be days where I would have to eat like 10 hot dogs. Oh, shit. Ugh. Because I would, we would do these long improv takes. And mm. because they were these long improv takes, I'd eat two thirds of a hot dog in the three minutes it took us and to improv spit it the out scene. Because you have to swallow yeah. it in the scene. Yeah. And so I would eat so, and I was, it was disgusting, you know, to your <laughs> point, Carl, about if you drank the, the full, you know, cranberry juice or whatever, it was like, I would have so much sodium, so much salt from the hot dogs in my system those days. It would be disgusting. <laughs> That's really well, funny. I got to talk about, I got to talk about this show a little bit because, you know, Phil, I know you, as a performer. And when we first started performing together, you were working on Brooklyn nine, nine as a writer and you got this show and this show and talking to Carl about this show. What I love about it is it really comes from this place of like, it is your life. These are a majority of people in this cast are your friends. And so just talk me through like how you got this idea for the show and what you wanted to do. Cause I feel like for people who have not seen grand crew kind of set the table for Absolutely. us. Absolutely. So I was working on Brooklyn nine, nine. I wrote on Brooklyn nine, nine, uh, seasons three, four, five, and six, right in the middle of that time. Um, the creator of that show, Dan Gore was like, Hey, we have a good working dynamic. If you ever want to develop something, let me know. And, and you know, I, I'm all about working with folks. Uh, I'm all about collaboration. I, I just love it so much. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the improviser in, in all of us, everybody in this yeah. room right now. It's like, oh shit, you, you fuck with what you fuck with what I'm fucking with. Like, let's, let's try and make some yeah. shit happen. And um, we started meeting weekly while the room was up and we were just tossing around some random ideas. Like, you know, what if a, a dentist 
can't be a dentist anymore and he's got to figure out his life or a group of people get stuck in an arc like crazy high premise stuff right. like what 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 has a hook to wait, it wait what else i want to know about the dentist i want to know, know what dentist. maybe i'll still right. maybe i'll still do this dentist thing you know it's got legs Car- carl's like carl's like wait that's the role i want i want the dentist who's not a dentist anymore yeah yeah make that a storyline for carl's know, character right? on the show that, that we could do it i mean carl carl's character is the one that hops around career-wise it would be funny if it's if it's revealed that Carl's character, you know, this, I feel like this season, Carl's character is an Uber driver. If it's revealed that he has, uh, he can be a practicing dentist, he just isn't. Yes, that's amazing. (laughs) I mean, the beauty of it is his character is a genius, so he can be good at anything immediately, much like the real Carl Tart. So it's like, so that is, that's, that's the thing on the table. Like Carl, Carl keeps pitching me that uh, Sherman becomes a weatherman. I'm like, it's funny. Oh, I love <laughs> like, that. It's funny. Yeah, that's a, you got to wait until like season that. six so you can spin that exactly. off. And it's I like, good morning. That every four good morning, or five Miami. episodes, <laughs> yeah. Carl just has a different full blown career. Different career. Yeah. Um, oh. yeah, but we, you know, and so, but before we start these meetings, Dan would be like, oh, so what's going on in your life? Like, you know, he's got like a family. So his life's just very like different than mine is. Um, right. And I just be like, Oh, I hang out with the homies at this bar called uh, Covell. And, you know, we just talk about our lives, our dating lives, career and blah, blah, blah. And then after like a couple of weeks, I think it was Dan that was like, I think that might be the show. And I was like, yeah, I think, you know, they say, they yeah. say that cliche. It's like, write what you know. And that, that's how it happened. So it, it was like us trying to come up with like very clever ideas, but starting our days talking about just the things that were going on in my life. And then this wine bar became a very, a very obvious kind of tapestry to create the show. And then the rest is just a bunch of, you know, putting the pitch stock together. But now Carl, mm-hmm. you come in, you know, Phil, you know, Nicole, you have to audition for this. And we all have to audition for stuff, right? Especially yeah. this is an NBC show. Yeah. Like where are you at when you come into it? So we were hanging out and we were would be at Covell through every step of right. when he said we're about to pitch the show. We got a we got a full deck. We got this. We got that. We're about to go in tomorrow. We sold the show in the room. We did it. And at that moment, I'm just a supportive friend. Yeah. Like now I know what the show is about. I know that I know I'm probably going to audition for it. Like this is the realest, right. honest to God truth. Uh, but I like at that moment, I'm just being supportive friend, just happy for my homeboy that he is sold the show. He's about to be a showrunner, like uh, to a major network. That's dope. I'm in the Keenan room at the time. And that's when the audition process starts. So I auditioned for the first time. Uh, and the first time I, I was prepared for Phil to be in the room, but our other friend, Tim Chang was also in the room. And I kind of was like, man, get your ass out of here. <laughs> right. Tim was, Tim was uh, my assistant at the time uh, for the, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I was like, I didn't, I didn't know he was going to be <laughs> here too. I just, get, get, get out of here. And I think he did leave. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, had to go back like the next day. But, but again, that was just another job for me. Didn't go in there. Uh, of course, I'm not going to go in there and act like I don't know who Phil is. Right. But like, I'm I'm here to do a job. So I'm going to try to be good at that job. And I auditioned for two characters that day. And and so I was, you know, wanted to be. And, you know, did I. And this this is uh, any casting directors listening to this. I'm sorry. But <laughs> this job, I probably prepare for a little bit more, you know. <laughs> Yeah, like then I normally now, is that because you re- is that because you wanted to do right by Phil or because yes. you really wanted it? Yeah, and or both. I didn't know both. It was actually it's both of those. Yeah. One, I didn't know what Phil had said to them about right. me, so I didn't want to go in there and mess up. And I, to be honest, I had had another situation that was like this, where I went into audition for the my player character on NBA Two K nineteen or twenty, oh. and. Was like, man, it's a video game. I'm finna, I'm just finna. And the script was like weird. And I was like, nah, I'm finna go in here and read all the scripts, it'll be fine. And I walk into the room and I give buddy Aaron Covington, who also wrote Creed, wrote is the person who yeah. wrote the the copy. And I and I oh, wow. I bombed it. <laughs> and I the, bombed uh, it. When you bomb it, it when you bomb an audition, it sucks. But when you yeah. bomb an audition in front of a friend who has like vouched for you or who has yeah. brought you in, then it re, you feel yeah. just absolutely horrible i felt horrible to where i apologized to him i was like hey man i don't know if you talked me up to the people or anything like that but i'm sorry man i did not know you was gonna be in there 
<laughs> and to be honest, when I saw NBA 2K, I was like, man, what is this? Like, what? Right. I, I got other things to do. It's not like you play NBA 2K and go like, wow, the acting yeah. on that yeah. my exactly. player. Really? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I did not. I didn't know what the hell was going to happen. I didn't know how deep they were going to start getting. Right. This was probably like one of the first ones where they really went deep into the mm. storyline. They had all these cutscenes and everything. So I didn't know what that was going to be. So I, I did not prepare well for that one. So this time, going in, knowing that I really wanted to do the show, knowing that I, knowing that I was going to go in and be seen in front of a friend, I really prepared for it. And I had both, both characters lines memorized and everything. And I like really did the work and, and wanted to do a good job. And then they called me back the second time. And I went back in, had to do the same thing again. I figured that there were gonna, now that I seen Tim Chang in there, I feel like there was going to be more people in the room that I was going to know. So just being prepared for that and Phil, probably Dan, who I also worked for. And like, I didn't know, I, I was just preparing for m- myself for everything. And so went back and then they called me back for the chemistry reads. And then Phil called me and told me that I had gotten the part and it was, you know, kind of surreal in that moment. And it still felt like it was, it was amazing. And, but then, you know, those thoughts, those intrusive thoughts get into your head. Like, yeah. man, now everybody's going to think that I just got this because Phil's my friend. They don't know the process that I just went through. They don't know how, you know, like they don't. <laughs> and, 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 and so, but it was, it, that's just what we do as people who care. And, and like, I, I, was extremely grateful and and am still extremely grateful for it. And for this to be my first long term job, I couldn't ask for a better one. For the fact that we do all yeah know each other and and are like because you know you know you guys know how it is like being in that UCB green room where the person that's booked a job comes in. And they're complaining about it a little bit. And everybody's like, man, fuck you, man. We got to drink these right, free yeah. Bud Lights out of this fridge because we can't afford drinks at the bar next door. I don't give a shit that you're having a horrible time on your TV show. Kiss yeah. my ass. <laughs> there is something to be said for, you know, what you're talking about, which is, you know, what you guys have is an ensemble based comedy show that mm-hmm. is majority your peer group, your friend group, yeah. the people that you, I'm assuming, love working with and are able to elevate in a way that is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Like yeah. your dyna- your individual dynamics are come, a- come through so hard. The fact that you guys all know each other and are vibing off of each other and are riffing off of each other, uh, that is so much, it's baked into the ensemble nature of this show, which makes it feel so much, uh, so much funnier than just a sitcom that's set up at a bar or whatever. There's something yeah. about this friend group being based on your actual friends and having all of you guys there. It's pretty fantastic. Like you riffing with with Nicole and right now, like Nicole and Colton as a couple, like there's stuff in this so show that is fun. just absolutely hilarious. And then there's just stuff that I think, like I, I wrote you, Carl, last year, like in season one, I don't remember which episode it was, but you're wearing an all white outfit. Yeah. <laughs> and one, one, one 105. They, oh, if you just play, oh, the the opening moment of that is like the the wine like tap. It's like a beard, you know, like kind of breaks, and you just get soaked in yeah. this. It I laughed so hard <laughs> at that. Like, and there's some big moments like that. I feel like the the sleepover sleepover episode, like I think that's one hundred three. Like, yeah, like there's like so you can do this like big. I don't know, big fun comedy stuff, but then it's also like based in these characters. I just love the, I love the relationship between these characters and you can kind of go between both of these. Oh yeah. It's things. got like real heart, but it's also absolutely. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sick. I mean, we, yeah, we yeah. want to, we want hard last. That's, that's the goal. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Also, I will say with that cold open with the wear and white, I mean, a version of that, I mean, the show is just a heightened version of the stuff that we go through. Some of it is, you know, just pulled from the headlines of stuff we've gone through. And some of it's like, oh, interesting conversations we had that we get to make stories out of. But I definitely s- right. spilled wine all over Carl. All over Carl. All over <laughs> Carl. At, uh, the, the st- is it called The Study? The place that's next to uh, Hyperion. Not Hyperion, Public, uh, public uh, House. Public yeah, House. Yeah, I don't know if you study, remember, yeah. Carl. We were all out one oh. night. We were all out one night. You were wearing a really dope outfit. And then I think we had switched locations to that bar. And I ordered like a cab sob and I spilled it like all over your outfit. And you were like, and you, and you were so, I mean, what are you going to do? It's like, you're, you're obviously you're a little like, oh, well, I wish that didn't happen. But it's like, we're ho- we're homies. So yeah. you're like, all right. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. Um, and, and then it was, and then you, I think much like the cold over, you were like, yeah, I think I'm going to go home. Like, <laughs> <just> like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I just, it makes me laugh so hard because I feel like it is like, this is like a fun, I mean, again, it's a fun friend group, but then I also feel like there's this other element that I feel like other shows really hasn't captured, which is this wine culture stuff as well. Well, there's like, there's wine conversations in the show, you know, like akin to Sideways. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like where you, where you guys are, are seem to be interested in talking about, the, not just as a setting, but talking about the wine that's Absolutely. happening. I mean, yeah, I think the, yeah. you know, and, and Carl can speak to this too, but like, I think the goal is to track it over how our relationship with wine has evolved in real life. So like when we first started going to Covell, we didn't really know anything. And so we're asking a lot of questions and, you know, it's it's coming a little bit more from a place of kind of being new to the terrain. And then the idea in season two is to make it kind of imbue it a little bit more seamlessly because the more time you spend at this place, the more you get to know what you like and things of that nature. And so that's right. kind of, that was the thought behind you know, how we're treating it. But it's been really nice to see people that are wine enthusiasts really gravitate towards the show as well. Do you have yeah. like a, like a med, like, you know, like a hospital dramas will have like a medical expert on set. Do you have like a, a, a wine? Sommelier. Expert, a sommelier, yeah. 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 yeah you do. do. Devin Reed. <laughs> Devin Reed. <laughs> Amazing. He's, he's awesome. I love that. And Carl, like, are, were you a wine drinker? I mean, you were with this crew before that. Like, are you, are you still a wine drinker? Like, it's that's yeah. something I feel like I can't quite put my palate on. Like, Jason, you've introduced me to good wines. I like drinking, but I feel like I don't have enough adventurous people. June will only drink one wine, which is <laughs> called butter. You can guess what that tastes like. Chardonnay. It's a white it's a wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a shard. Yeah. yeah. And but I, I don't, I can't drink that. It won't like, it. Does, it's fine. It's just not my go-to. Great so to like, go I, yeah. Like I, like for me, I'll open up a bottle of red, but I don't know how to keep it. My friend just gave me like this, like decanter that I put in there and it basically like it aerates. So it's like you, um, oh my gosh. I feel like I want to call it. Big white at the bottom. Yeah, very like narrow. Like, 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 put, <laughs> oh, oh that I have a, dec I have a, a decanter decanter. This is like a, I put a plug in the top of it and oh. then I put like a little machine, a little mm -hmm. device in it that's battery powered and has like a, an, I think this uh, is a, this is a dildo. Yeah. Yeah. And, <laughs> Paul, and, you might be talking like about suck a dildo. Yeah. And, like a, uh, and it's like, it vibrates. But this keeps like, but it keeps wine fresh. So now I'm able ah, to, yeah, I, I forget what it is called, it, but it's it, like a, yeah, a whereas Corvin. like a regular, a regular, like just corking it back would just, you you have to drink it within like two or three days. I think I've heard that this yes. you can have it for longer than that. <laughs> I've got yes. a couple. Of, I've got a couple of different versions of this, and yeah, they 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 give you a That's couple cool. of extra days basically, but yeah. not not too much more. I'm right with you there, Paul. When it comes to wine drinking, so I the the pilot episode last season when we walk in and uh, and I'm like, okay, uh, I I want to turn up. Like I'm not yeah. trying to. What is this? That really happened. Uh, one night, P Phil had a, the night that we started going to Covell, Phil had a meeting there and, uh, he was like, yo, just meet me. We, we, it was a Saturday night. So we were about right. to go out, you know, get on the town. And, uh, and Phil was like, meet me at this spot. And I'm like, cool. And I walk up to the bar. I'm like, yeah, let me get a whiskey Coke. And, uh, they're like, we don't do that here. And I'm like, well, <laughs> what the hell are we doing here? Cause this right. is all, this is a proper, just like wine That's and beer bar. bar. Yeah. And the you know, beer is not going to be like anything that you reckon. It's going to be a small brew. It's going to yeah. be, they, they have yeah. four different ciders. Yeah. And I don't be wanting beer. You know what I mean? Like I'm already, like I, I'd rather have my carbs elsewhere. Like I'd yeah. rather go to Subway. I don't want, I'd rather go to Jersey Mike's. I don't want to have, I don't want to drink my Jersey Mike's. And so, but then once we got into it and started learning about it and, and being able to talk it and stuff like that, then it, it, it got a lot easier to, to deal with. And I also do have a lot of wine here We because we've all gone up the coast and joined clubs and they send the wine. And then you got to be like, hey, can you cancel this? Because I'm not drinking this wine as fast <laughs> right, right, as you're yeah. sending it. Oh, yeah. Oh, whenever wow. you go up, whenever you go and visit any winery, you're like, I'm going to drink this every day. And then all of a sudden, like yeah, two that, cases yeah, later, like, oh, shit, I got to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I have so much. And the only time I open it up is, you know, I might I don't I don't drink at home, really. Right. And so. I, I have wasted a, quite a few bottles when I open them and then leave them on the counter or put them in the fridge. And then uh, three weeks goes by. And I'm like, I can't drink this. This is bad. Yeah. yeah. So I've <laughs> I've gotten two glasses out of it. If I'm, you know, entertaining a Mademoiselle or something like that. Oh, really? I, I, I've French never, woman. I never, uh, <laughs> yeah, French woman. Uh, a lot of French ladies in my neighborhood. Uh, well, but I'll get away. If you're, you're only going to give a French girl wine. <laughs> yeah. 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 She doesn't want it. She, she can't. Yeah, she can't. 
You have but a bunch of croissants. Home, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I'm at home cooking, I'm I want cactus cooler or something like that. <laughs> I don't I don't want wine, and so uh, but I do like it when we go out. And now right, that I yeah. can like talk it and 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 really like you know identify like we have a we have a mutual friend shout out Cassandra mm-hmm. who works at the wine spot and she'll like quiz me she'll just pour up something and be like okay tell me what you tell me what you oh, taste cool. in here yeah. Yeah. and she's mm-hmm. the best and we have a like we'll sit there and and I'll be able to you know identify notes and stuff now guys i know that the the show obviously is every friday night but i want to talk to you about what you're all into phil yes. besides being a great writer directing episodes this season as well uh you also create yeah. music and I love your music. Including the theme song for Grand Crew. Cabernet and Sauvignon team is here and now it's on. Carry on and carry on, sipping on carry on. Fine wine got notes like a cello. Pull up in a spot like hello. If you got me, then I got you. This is the vibe. This is the crew. Grand Crew. Grand Crew. Crew. You can follow Phil on Spotify, but what are you listening to? What are you watching? Like, what are you into right uh, now? Right now, I'm trying to think what I've, what I've been listening to. I have been listening to any new albums I've been listening to. I've been listening to like old stuff. That's good. Tell us, yeah. That's I mean, okay. I listen, I listen to a lot. Of, I love jazz, so I listen to a lot of Coltrane. I want to go on these walks and stuff like that. I feel like I've um, there's a there's a recently released um, Elvin Jones. Uh, album that is like old oh. live Elvin, uh, and yeah, it's, it's incredible. Uh, okay, yeah, worth absolutely. Dragging I'll check that out. I mean, it's a, that's been the vibe lately. Like, a, like Anita Baker, right. Carl, Carl put together a playlist of like old school jams to help me get inspired for this season of Grand Crew, and so I listen to that playlist when I'm walking. When I'm walking, sometimes. Ooh, that's great. That's great. That's like I love because I do that too when I'm writing something. I, I but it, it's great that it came from Carl. I create a playlist yeah, that I feel same. like these are the songs from this script or yeah. this thing I'm putting. Yeah, just together. like Inspo has been really fantastic. Um, I I just finished the this book called Atomic Habits. That was pretty cool to like just just to get inspired and just to get more efficient with life and shit like that. I got to tell you a book that I think you'll. Re- I, I was going to tell Jason about this. I've been talking about this, um, Rick Rubin's book, The Creative oh, Act. It, it is so good. It it blew me away. Like there, every now and then, I'll read a book. I'll write that down. That like you're talking about Atomic yeah. Habits, where you're like, oh, this changes a little bit of my perception of things. The Creative Act, a way of being, Rick Rubin, it just changed my way. I really of thinking I've, about creativity, yeah. partnership, collaboration. Yeah. And it's like, and it's not like, he's not trying to sell you anything. Like, it's not like. He doesn't need to. Like, yeah, what, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's how I felt about that documentary he did, uh, Shangri-La, that was, uh, that's about his studio that was uh, oh, destroyed yeah. in the fires. In and Malibu, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's all about that studio and his process. And it's like five episodes and it's very similar. It's all about the creative process and wh- what his kind of purpose or what his point of view is inside of his job as a a, a producer and it's all to facilitate the creative process that's mm-hmm. his whole thing to not get in the way to get out of the way and to help uh facilitate anyway super interesting and a million like like great uh, uh insights yeah. from him i thought in that thing that's awesome it was so interesting he was talking he was um you can listen to him read it too because he reads his own book on an audible so it's, he's got a great yeah. voice and uh but he i listened to him on an interview show i'm not a big grateful dead fan like that's not been something that i've ever you know i'm not against it but i'm just not you know whatever <laughs> and uh he was talking about why they are so interesting. And they're like, why are, why is that band? Like, why do people get behind it? And he was like, they're not perfect. And that's, what's interesting. He was like, there are bands out there that are tighter, that are stronger, that are better. But when you're watching it, you feel like you're watching something that's wholly unique that can never really quite happen again. Like you're a part of it. It has that jazz element, uh, improv element. It's interesting. Well, that's what I was just going to say as improvisers, what people love, what fans are obsessed with about the Grateful Dead, like the Grateful Dead's studio albums are almost irrelevant Hmm. to the fan base. 
Right. It is the interpretations of those songs that are performed live and how the band takes the inspiration from those original songs and turns them into these things that then are being interpreted for years and years and years. And and so that's why fans of the dead are so dedicated to, oh, my favorite version of that song is the live at the film or this, or is that is this date here? Or this song really didn't become what it was until they figured this part of it so out. Or what, so what types of changes are they are they doing live though? Are, is it, are we talking jams. like so, oh okay they're jamming it's out. It's all gotcha. jams. Okay. It's all jams, gotcha. and those jams then can inform a song that was recorded very slowly on an album becomes a much faster, like the whole song can change. Yeah. And this is the case for a lot of jazz albums as is well. It, is Fish the same? Fish is the same. You know, Fish is the like, same. Yeah, it's fish is like, I feel like there's just something that's a little bit more elevated, I guess. But Trey Anastasio has like that same, like he's a genius. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe the culture. No, no, are, they, it, yeah, it they, is. Uh, it's the, all those artists are about. If similar again to what we do. Yeah, they it's they are all about the perf- the live performance, the live experience, and that it's there for this night only yeah. or whatever. You know, like it is those those albums. If you're gonna listen to, you know, like it, Miles is never gonna play, you know, um, Olio the way he did on the album. He's gonna every every show, every solo is a different interpretation of that. It's song. interesting to think you about uh, an album being like an outline. <laughs> for yeah. for the live performance which is like exactly. not usually how i approach listening to music but that's cool i think that's really cool um that to carl you got a great podcast mm-hmm. gossip kings where you're watching yeah. gossip girls <laughs> uh, and yeah. by the way i've told so many people about this podcast it's hilarious <laughs> and i have people like young girls uh i know listen to this podcast because they are also watching gossip girls like they just happen to be watching it at the same time i've recommended it so it's become like a hit there like so you got to listen to that but what else are you up to like what are you into like and listening to or or watching or reading Uh, so i've always been like an old soul with music my mom is my i got a young mom and so I listened to a lot of the music that she grew up listening to because she was still playing it because it's, yeah. you know, what she likes. But uh, I also one thing I noticed before we had uh, streaming platforms, DSPs and stuff like that, was I would know all these artists, but only know one or two of their hits. Yeah. And so sure. I at, now that we have access to like their whole catalogs, I'll go back and listen to their albums and realize that some of them suck. <laughs> And I'm like, man, they came out with like two good songs, but this album is trash. (laughs) And so like, I don't want to put the artists out there, but uh, I will say like, I've been, as far as new stuff goes, uh, I'm still Drake and 21 Savages album is still in heavy rotation for me. Uh, Of course, uh, SZA's new album is, is still in heavy rotation for me is very, very good. Uh, I listen to the, the R&B uh, Spotify playlist and, and find new artists to to check out. And I also still play. I, I've realized that I'm becoming the old head that only plays music from uh, when I first started driving. Yeah. And so my 2007 playlists are very uh, in rotation right now, especially when I go back to like the area I grew up in, which is just, you know, the West side of LA. If I'm going to like check my mail or something, <laughs> I go, let me, let me turn on this. And I remember when I first used to turn down this street when I was a senior in high school or whatever. But uh, watching wise, yeah, we've been XOXO Gossip Kings, the podcast. I am watching uh, Gossip Girl uh, in real time, uh, one like one to two episodes a week. Uh, so don't spoil anything for me. Those people out there, if you do, I'll block you. <laughs> and uh, how, much, how far in? Because this has been going on for years now. How far into this are you? Uh, season four, episode six. Wow. I think there are six. Oh, OK. Seasons. Okay, so you still have a, way, still have a ways girl. to go. Who's your favorite uh, gossip girl? Oh man, uh, Paul, these people are so terrible. <laughs> and watching this through the lens of a 33 year old man, 33 year old black man at that, this is an experience that I have no interest in. Like, <laughs> and, and so I and I, but I do like the show. I'm not gonna say I don't like it, but I also hate it at the same time. Sure. But I don't have a favorite character because these are all the types of people who I've dealt with over the years, and I hate these type of people. <laughs> so when people ask, "Well, who's your favorite character on the show?" I go, "Rufus, the dad." <laughs> and and everybody's like, "Why do you like him so?" But he doesn't do anything. And I go, "Yeah, but he's the only normal nice person. <laughs> like, everybody else is such a piece of shit." 
And uh, so it's very hard. Rufus, the old, and, and Serena's little brother, Eric, is it, also like a normal person. Settle, uh, Rufus, the dad. Uh, <laughs> guys, uh, season two has started. You could start off if you wanted. Like season two, we're coming back from a cliffhanger of season one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Noah has proposed, but you're still, you could catch up if you have Peacock. And you should have Peacock. They've got great stuff. You can catch up on uh, Grand Crew whenever you want. It's uh, open to you. Mm-hmm. But if you want to watch it live on NBC, and you should, uh, that's on Friday nights, 8.30. That's right. right. 8.30. Friday's at 8.30. And listen, if you've got Peacock, order, pull up Grand Crew and play the just whole thing straight in a row. Yeah, yeah, let let it go. Just, just autoplay the whole let season. Make your way through it, but autoplay the whole season. Finish the show. Yes, it makes a difference in our world now. It makes a difference. It does. Get on it. It really does. And also, it should be noted that I think everyone in this room has worked on Brooklyn Nine-Nine in some mm-hmm. capacity. Yeah. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. And so, absolutely. now it has been established that Grand Crew exists in the Brooklyn Nine-Nine universe. This is amazing, because yes. Because we had Will Hines Great. on the show as his character from Brooklyn Nine nine Carl Kerm. Incredible. And yeah. so that's just the thing I wanted to say. And I, I was just very happy to I do that. It was well, my old listen, roommate. You also, know, so. <laughs> Adrian, Adrian Pimento on Grand Crew. Ooh, make it happen. <laughs> yeah, my, make it my, happen. my cybersecurity expert who loves charcuterie. Uh, we're talking about <laughs> eating food on set. There was a bit that we cut out of uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine. It was like me and Chelsea Pretty going at it. And I had to eat a whole like olive and then spit out the pit but it was hard to de like to, <laughs> to get clean the, the olive yeah that's clean not an easy thing to every do. time <laughs> and they had to cut it for time but chelsea's like that was like one of my favorite bits in the show that we could this is not on the yeah, show because yeah. it just took too my long. character <laughs> and I, I played a delivery man who got who was really high who got scared during a a, a crime scene on brooklyn 99 uh that delivery man did not have a name was his name sherm Probably, uh, probably Sherm. Uh, yes. Could have been Sherm. Sherm had a little yeah. stint uh, in Brooklyn. That would be pretty great. I love that this. That would be pretty great. But yeah, whenever you need me, uh, Pimento absolutely say less. Let's can, get can roll right <laughs> through Greg Crew. It caused a lot of love chaos. <laughs> um, this is so fun, guys. Watch Grand Crew. You will love it. And the cast is not just... I just think it's one of the best casts on TV, too. We talked about Nicole Byer, who's a How Did This Get Made uh, favorite. Uh, So watch her on the show. I think she's fantastic on this show. Echo Kellum is so great. Everybody. You've introduced me to people that I love, too. So Grand Crew, Peacock, NBC, do it up. Thank you, Phil. Thank Thank you, you, Carl. Thank you so much. Appreciate y'all. Thank you so much to Phil and Carl for chatting with me and Jason. And be sure to check out season two of Grand Crew airing every Friday at 8.30 p.m. or stream it on Peacock. And to all you singer and songwriters out there, remember, we're always accepting new theme songs for Just Chat and other Last Look segments. So send them in at How Did This Get Made at Earwolf.com. Okay, now that we got C-School out of the way, let's talk about next week's film. We are going from a race in the snow to a chase for some dough. That's right. <laughs> I love, I love these transitions. Uh, We are watching the 2022 action flick Ambulance, directed by Michael Bay and starring Jake Gyllenhaal. Here's a short breakdown of the plot. Two brothers, one a career criminal, the other a decorated veteran, hijack an ambulance after a heist getaway that goes spectacularly wrong. Rotten Tomatoes gives this film a 68% score on the tomato meter, and Christy Lemire from KPCC in Los Angeles says, Ambulance is so dumb, and I was so ashamed of myself for enjoying it as much as I did. Christy, I feel the same. Let's take a listen to the trailer. 32 million. You're my brother. I will do anything for you. Get down! Get down, down, down! I came to you for a loan, not this. Stop! What do you want? Just gonna borrow it. Bank robbery suspects have taken an ambulance. We're doing hostages now. Does your wife know you're up, Banks? I'm gonna get you back home, little brother. I'm gonna get everybody home. Ambulance. You can stream Ambulance for free on Amazon Prime Video or rent it on Apple TV, YouTube, or Google Play. I encourage you to also check out Hoopla or Canopy, which are digital media services offered by your local public library that allow you to consume movies, books, audiobooks, ebooks, comics, and TV shows for free. That is it, people. Please remember to rate and review the show. It helps. And if you listen on Apple Podcasts, make sure you are following us. Visit us on social media at HDTGM for commercial free access to how this get made in our entire archive and so, so much more. Sign up for Stitcher Premium for a free one-month trial using the code BONKERS, as B-O-N-K-E-R-S. And a big thank you to our producers, Scott, 
Sonny, Molly Reynolds, and our movie picking producer, Avril Halley, our engineer, Alex Gonzalez, and our publisher, July Diaz. We will see you next week for Ambulance. Ambulance.